and welcome to a special edition of The Record Europe from the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Well, we'll be looking back on what's been a tumultuous year, a defining 12 months here at the European Parliament. One characterised by disunity between EU member states and a deep questioning of some of the most important principles underpinning the European Union. At the same time, from many quarters, there's been growing support for big European solutions. 2010 saw European governments, as in the rest of the world, struggling to contain the effects of the global economic and financial crisis. There was high drama with the rescues of Greece and Ireland, fear of contagion and of collapse. A standoff from members of this House over the EU's annual budget revealed a Parliament emboldened, even cocky with its new powers under Lisbon. There were tough new laws aimed at the banks and the hedge fund managers with new European institutions to oversee the financial sector. Money matters have dominated the agenda this year, but as the EU has groped for solutions, an even more fundamental question has surfaced again and again. Where does the power lie in the EU? Who calls the shots? Deep tensions have been revealed between countries to the north and in the south, between rich and poor members too, as well as between institutions, MEPs and national governments, national leaders and the European Commission. And of course, with a change of government in the United Kingdom, there's an important but complex new influence in the EU. A British government which has vowed not to allow any more powers to be transferred from Westminster to Brussels without a referendum. But when it comes to Europe, this coalition government of Liberal Democrats and Conservatives has tension at its very heart. With the help of my guests, we'll be examining the impact of that coalition so far in its relations with other EU countries and here at the European Parliament. We'll be hearing from the leaders of the four largest British parties in the Parliament, assessing the events of the past year and looking ahead to 2011 as well. Well, I'm joined by those four leaders. We have Martin Callanan, who was recently uh, elected to lead the British Conservatives at the European Parliament. We have Glenys <coughs> Wilmot, who leads the Labour MEPs here. Uh, we have Fiona Hall, who is leader of the British Liberal Democrats, and Nigel Farage, who leads the UK Independence MEPs. Thanks all of you for joining me. Uh, can I ask you, uh, Glenys, first of all, in some ways, David Cameron and his coalition have uh, performed a pretty clever balancing act so far. They've managed not to uh, isolate themselves, as many such as you and the Labour Party uh, were predicting, and they've even found some pretty important allies particularly in the budget talks recently. I mean, that's not bad going, is it? Well, I, I think that's a, uh, actually seeing it incorrectly. Um, what he's done is he's ha had to find out the realities of government. They got into government and they found out the realities are that they have to deal with 27 countries. And they, they can't be isolated if they want to deal with some of the problems. Look at the, the problems with uh, the financial crisis, all of those issues. He has to work together with other European leaders. And that's been a lesson he's had to learn very quickly. And he's done it. So the predictions uh, that you made uh, actually just never came to pass. I'm not sure if he has actually done it. Uh, he's causing a lot of problems with his Eurosceptic wing. And I'm sure if you talk to some of the MEPs, the Tory MEPs here, they're not very happy at what seems to be a very pro-European stance. Is that true? I mean, Martin Callanan, you are sometimes described as the thinking man's Eurosceptic. Uh, uh, are, you one of those, Eurosceptic. are you one of those that privately thinks that your Prime Minister went too far uh, in accepting, for example, legislation on hedge fund managers, on financial supervisory bodies, even uh, buckling uh, and, and, and deserting that position for a freeze on the EU budget? Well, on most of those issues, of course, he had no choice because power has already been given away um, by Labour and by others uh, in the past. These are all subject to qualified majority voting. All uh, David Cameron could do was try to win friends, influence people, and win the best deal for Britain uh, in an admittedly bad lot. And I think he's done a very good job at that. On the budget, we would all have liked to have seen a budget freeze or ideally some budget reductions. But again, under, under Lisbon and previous treaties, this is now subject to qualified majority voting. He no longer has a veto, so he has no choice legally. The best that he can do is to win enough support, and he's done that, and he managed to get uh, an increase of 2.91%. I would have preferred a freeze or indeed a reduction, but that wasn't simply uh, an, an option that was on offer. Nigel Farage, do you agree with that reading? 
Not a bit, no. Actually, this <laughs> government has been really very enthusiastic for European integration. I mean, not only did this government accept the European External Action Service, but William Hague now goes around publicly eulogising about the need for the European Union to have a big, strong foreign policy. Now, that is a very big policy change. Similarly, with, with upgrades to the European arrest warrant, uh, we saw Theresa May, the Home Secretary, quite enthusiastically telling the House of Commons that this was the next logical step to take. So, to make the argument that they've just inherited all of this from the last Labour government is nonsense. And you can, one thing you can say for certain is that Haig and Cameron are very popular in the European Union because they're just as integrationist, if not more so, than the previous Labour government. And that presumably must come as a rather pleasant surprise for the Liberal Democrats, uh, Fiona Hall, except for the fact that we're now seeing the cracks beginning to show. I mean, your colleague, Andrew Duff, who's an MEP here, who speaks for the uh, Liberal group uh, in the Parliament, so that's the European parties as well, is talking about the EU sovereignty bill and the UK as being bad Tory policy. That's hardly the talk of a coalition partner, is it? I should clarify, he speaks on constitutional affairs for the Liberal group, not in general. Um, no, I mean, I, I don't entirely agree with Nigel because I wouldn't say that the coalition government was integrationist, but I have been pleased that they have shown a realistic um, desire to engage positively um, with their counterparts in other countries as they signed up to do in the coalition government. So you don't think he represents uh, the views of, uh, of your colleagues, your MEPs here, your other Liberal Democrat colleagues? Mm. I think the difference is, is that we acknowledge that there is a coalition going on in the UK and that means that we don't all of us get what we want all of the time. And, um, you know, Andrew was being a bit grumpy recently because he was feeling that, you know, he hadn't got everything he wanted. That's understandable and I have, I have sympathy for him. But Martin. the coalition government is, you know, it, it, it's pushing forward very positively. Martin, you said uh, recently uh, on the Record Europe, in fact, that the coalition doesn't stand here at the European Parliament and therefore you have the right to express and advocate your own views. How does, how should the coalition work? Because you're not voting together on well, every I mean, issue, are you? I mean, I is that we're, a problem? We're in separate parliamentary groups here, which take a, a distinctly different approach to, to European integration. We're against it. The Liberals are for it. The realities of Westminster politics dictate one set of agendas. But of course, the way this, the, the parliament works here, we are constantly building coalitions across all of the different groups. Often, all the UK parties will vote together across the spectrum on, a, on an issue that's important to the UK. Often we work with Liberals, sometimes with, with Socialists, sometimes with, uh, with Nigel's grouping. And to get, a, to get agreement on any particular piece of legislation, or ideally to stop a piece of legislation, you have to build a coalition across the Parliament. So, uh, you know, we talk to politicians across the whole spectrum. Well, Everybody does, because argue. it's the way the place works. You cannot argue <clears throat> that you're against integration when actively in that chamber, your MEPs vote for integration no, every don't. single time. And in particular, true, and in particular, mm. can I talk about the fact that since this coalition government came to power, we have agreed, we've signed on the dotted line for Britain's biggest industry, financial services, mm. to now be 100% regulated by yeah. three new European authorities. That is one of the biggest economic integrationist moves we've seen since we joined the common market, and your party has enthusiastically supported it at every we stage. Did, we did not enthusiastically support it. You voted you for it, that. you've supported we it. We did not. We went you, in there. You voted we for motions we had calling no, for directives. No choice but to negotiate, to negotiate on the subject because, no. again, it was subject to no, come on. qualified majority voting, which no, is forget, true. That's at the Council of Ministers. And forget that. It's subject to, forget to the red But the problem well. is that so your, we own back the red your own backbenchers, your own backbenchers, though, I mean, obviously, the UK Independence Party is going to attack you, but your own backbenchers back home are very unhappy <coughs> about the position being taken in the EU. Now, how do you understand that? Yes, of course. Well, I what mean, are you going to do well, about because it? Because we, we had a manifesto which said that, uh, that we wanted to take powers back from Europe into the UK, particularly on social policy. Um, you may not have noticed, but we didn't get a majority at uh, Westminster. Therefore, we had to form a coalition with another party who take a slightly different approach than we do on European affairs. There are some measures that are in the coalition agreement, uh, abolition of Strasbourg, <clears throat> making the working time directive um, work better for, for the UK, which are in the coalition agreement, and I hope that the government will, will, will be able to deliver 
pressure on those with, uh, with treaty changes uh, accordingly. But we have to keep up the pressure for them to do that. Fiona, I mean, there is the potential next year to see this thing unravelling a bit, isn't there? I mean, given this pressure back mm. home, on people, perhaps, uh, like Martin, to, to show a sort of tougher line when it comes to uh, legislation here. I don't think so. I mean, you will get the coalition partners voting differently just because we are the Parliament and as MEPs we have a slightly different perspective from the Council. And that's nothing to do with parties. It happened quite regularly under the Labour government and it's simply what you would expect. There's a difference in institutional perspectives here. But I don't see problems going forward. I think that um, Martin, um, well, I think that the, the MEPs here will do what they want to do um, and I, whether they decide to go with the government or not is up to them um, but I think that we will um, go forward with a, um, a positive uh, and engaged uh, agenda uh, and that's yes, the is let, let our role is not here to be representatives of the government um, you know we clearly we are members of parties that are in the government but you know we're not here as government representatives if the government supports things that's something that's good we'll support them if mm -hmm. we don't agree with them then we are perfectly at liberty to say actually we don't agree with with coalition policy on a particular area you know we are not whipped as members of the government no but it'd be good if your critical, government listened to you every now and again friends. isn't it as well <laughs> I mean speaking to some conservative MEPs uh, I got the definite feeling there was a lot of disgruntled um, feelings uh, about the lack of consultation on the budget for example and how it all works I think we've got quite a lot of good consultation on the budget. It varies from subject area to subject area, depending on who the minister is. There is obviously going to be problems ahead for the coalition, and it's going to come from the Tory <coughs> right, because the Eurosceptic MPs in, in the Tory party are very, very <coughs> unhappy at the, the, the stance that Cameron and, and Osborne and the rest of them are taking. There is no doubt that is a fact. So there are huge problems coming their way, and they can say all they like, <coughs> but it's a fact, and they, the attack will come from their own right wing in the Tory party. You believe me it won't come from the liberals it'll come from the tory right wing now one area though where we're talking about you know splits or whatever but one area where you all were fairly solid as british parties was on the budget mm -hmm. which of course got agreed um in this last session um but i gather that three of you voted against one of you voted for <coughs> um how big an issue do you think this was and how do you think it's going to develop in the next year, Nigel? Well, I mean, look, the form is, it doesn't actually matter how British MEPs vote on any issue because we can be outvoted. And here's another classic example. I think the fact is that, that at a time of austerity, at a time when the public across every country in Europe are perceiving cuts and rising unemployment, these institutions, <laughs> uh, with, with their own very, very dodgy accounts, which for the last 16 years have been queried by the auditors, once again, are increasing the budget. It's, it's gone up by 3%. I know some wanted it to be 6%. But, you know, this juggernaut just keeps on rolling. And I think money, I think money, the currency partly, but the sheer cost of the European Union is going to become a much bigger issue in British politics over the next five years because we're going to see issues like the rebate, which Mr Blair signed away, really beginning to kick in. Yes, and, and one of the things the Parliament has said, actually, as part of this budget agreement, is that value for money has got to be the key issue for, for next year. Actually, now, it, you're laughing. That's a joke. I mean, you know, <laughs> the idea that the European Parliament believes in value for money is uh, surely one of, the, one of the worst jokes I've heard this year. You know, the European Parliament believes in spending more money because it believes in more Europe, and they think that a bigger budget will get them more Europe. I mean, the Parliament is completely out of touch with the whole of the rest of Europe on this. Here we are. I mean, I couldn't believe that they're actually seriously arguing for a 6% increase in the EU budget when countries, some countries are putting, cutting back on their public expenditure by 20, 30%. People are taking real wage cuts. They're really hurting out there. And here is the, the cloistered world of the European Parliament, a bunch of federalists arguing for a 6% increase in the budget. It was almost a joke. And actually, it was actually bad for their cause. For those that believe in deeper European integration, the stance that the Parliament took on the budget made them all look well, completely the ridiculous. Well, they got 3%. Actually, many people here put 6% forward as, as a negotiation. Yeah. Many of them are delighted to have got 3%. But your, your coalition partner sitting next to you voted for that mm. agreement. The, the, we, the... We, we voted for a freeze at the beginning of the negotiation, but we have finished the negotiation now. There is a settlement with which the government is entirely happy because it was indeed the terms of the council. So, I mean, you're just playing politics, really, to vote against it at that point. If, it, if it's good enough for the government, it's good enough for me. You're all playing politics, including mm. Glenys. Absolutely.
absolutely not. I mean, Cameron went out and said that he was going to get a freeze. In August, the council came yeah. forward with the 2.9%. He won nothing. And he went home and pretended he'd got this great victory. Yeah. Absolute nonsense. The absolute idea, nonsense. The idea what that the we British Labour Party do, believes in budget what, austerity what, what, is an even we, bigger joke than what the Parliament we were trying to do, What we were trying to do is we put down measures that would have mm -hmm. a billion pounds of cuts on things like agricultural subsidies and other waste. And there are good things that are, uh, have got to be done in the future. We've got to look at jobs and growth strategy. We need <clears> money in, in those projects. But we ought to be taking it from those areas that are wasteful this is, this is and agricultural subsidies are, are one of the things we should be looking at and we want long-term reform not just I, for this for this budget for the, for I the completely years. agree with Glenis but this is rank political hypocrisy oh, rubbish, after 13 rubbish. years in government they actually conceded massive increases in the mm -hmm. EU budget including in agriculture we, we gave away the British rebate supposedly in exchange for changes to the agricultural policy nothing happened in fact they didn't even bother to send a British minister along to the summit where they were actually discussing agriculture. And now they're out of government. Since then, the Labour Party suddenly announced that they're converted to the cause of reducing the EU budget. This is gross political hypocrisy. Let's look at the slightly larger picture, mm. because this has been a massively tumultuous year for the EU. I mean, it's questioned the very principles about the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, national interests have risen to the fore. At the same time, though, you've <coughs> had big European solutions being pushed harder as well. Very odd kind of... Yeah, uh, there's a real dichotomy here, isn't there? I mean, I mean, you know, this parliament, all the EU institutions are trying to use the crisis that's been caused around the euro as a reason to gain more power and more centralisation. But I think. But you're trying to use the crisis too as a reason to destroy the whole well, thing, aren't I you? I think, you know, to a large extent, this euro crisis is something that we predicted over 10 years ago. So, I, you know, I think we're, we, we're playing this with a very straight bat. But I do think what's happened in 2010 is in every single European country, what you've seen is a genuine rise in euro scepticism, not just about the euro, but about the whole European project. And what legitimacy does it have when nobody has actually voted for this in free and fair referendums? But you've also, haven't you seen? Fiona, a, a, a push for economic governance is the big buzzword here. Actually, more Europe, not less of it, as a solution to all of that. I think that what has happened is that there's been a bit of a reality check. Um, both within the Eurozone and outside the Eurozone because the reality is that our economies are all intertwined and we do what, what happens in Greece and what happens in Portugal and what happens in Ireland obviously has a big effect immediately in the Eurozone and it was realised that having 16 different countries doing different economic policies with nobody really supervising things was not a sensible way to go but I think what we have also learned in the process is that we are are not an island in the UK in economic terms and we may not be in the euro but our banks are very inter involved and, and intertwined with the financial affairs in Ireland and so what the stability of the eurozone whether Nigel likes it or not politically is actually important for the UK as well but I don't um, think it's going to work for you yeah. because actually what we're doing mm -hmm. by helping cut by, by appearing to help countries like Ireland and Greece, we're actually keeping them trapped for longer inside a system from which inevitably they are going to break out. It's fun, it's fun this can't it. work. It's the fun, North and South in Europe cannot be together in one monetary union. The reality, That's pragmatism. The reality is now striking home that too many countries were allowed to join the Euro in the first place who clearly were not suitable, whose economies weren't in tune with the big powerhouses of Europe. So you have two alternatives. Either they leave the Euro, which would have been the sensible solution, or you try and exert ever more powerful central control. And ultimately, you have to concede monetary transfers from the richer Eurozone states to the poorer ones. And that's where the Eurozone is coming a cropper at the moment, because of course the Germans don't want to pay for all the weaker Europe, Eurozone economies who should never have been allowed to join it in the but first as place. You, as, it's as fundamentally as untenable that Ireland, Greece, Portugal, etc. will stay in the Euro in the long term. You will see defaults and you will see uh, massive pain and austerity in those but countries. But as Fiona says, uh, Glenis, it, <coughs> has there not been a tendency too much for countries like Britain to actually imagine that they are somehow more detached from all of this than they are. Yeah. Absolutely, and we're not. You know, what happens in the Eurozone <coughs> has a massive effect, and that's why the government is, is doing what they can to help Ireland. I mean, there's no doubt they're bailing Ireland out, and, and that's because it's so important to us. And whatever you say, whether you're in or out of the Eurozone, you know, look at the amount of trade we have within the Eurozone. It's too important to fail.
It's too important to fail for fail. us, even though we're not in the Eurozone. But we it's going to fail, Glenys. Ireland cannot stay in the Euro. It won't be in the Euro in five years' time, and we will have poured mm. £7 billion, pounds, good money after that. OK, let me just move on. Making a let me just move on to another yes. issue. Yes. Um, the Lisbon Treaty, which some of you supported, some of you didn't. Mm. Uh, about half and half, I'd say. Um, now, <laughs> th this year has been absolutely categorised by, um, here at the Parliament, about, uh, uh, trying to define what that actually means to MEPs. Do you think the Parliament, Martin, has been guilty of grandstanding, of over-egging it, of, of, of course, yeah. or actually I mean, it's a, it's a legitimately. Paragraph. I mean, they're, 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 a lot of the clauses in the Lisbon Treaty were written very opaquely, and nobody's quite sure what a lot of them mean. Nobody's quite sure where the power lies. So that's what you saw over the budget. You saw an attempt by the Parliament to try and grab more control over the budget, over the famous own resources, in effect EU taxation, <clears throat> and trying to give themselves more power over the, the next financial framework which is going to be negotiated next year. Thankfully member states have resisted that, but you saw it in terms of the external action service. And, uh, you well know, the that's Parliament debatable. Is never happy some member states uh, uh, haven't resisted it. More power for itself. Well some, some smaller member states think it's a good idea. And there is a, a declaration actually <clears throat> committing uh, uh, to more debate and discussion about the Parliament yeah. actually <clears throat> taking a, a greater role I mean there have, been, there have been some good things. Personally yeah. I think it's a very positive role that uh, if we're going to have these, uh, these trumped-up EU ambassadors in every country, then at least they have to appear in front of a parliamentary committee and be examined on their record, on their views of the policies that they're going to be advocating. So at least there is a, a little bit of transparency coming in there. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are one or two good things about uh, an essentially bad lot. Yeah. Fiona? It's a democracy grab. It's not a power grab. Let's mm -hmm. just look at some of the things that have happened this year. The SWIFT um, regulation. Um, a lot of data going to the states. The parliament intervened and said no. I mean, we have to sign up to treaties. Um, you know, we, we are able to do that and we will. Some of the trade agreements now where, I mean, our people mm -hmm. back home and probably everybody is in the same position gets lots of letters about um, uh, abuses going on which can be raised in the context of a, of a trade agreement and haven't been in the past. Now the Parliament has a say. The Citizens Initiative that we voted on this week, people coming forward um, <coughs> directly uh, in order to um, ask for, for legislation. Nigel is, uh, Nigel well. is laughing. A Citizens Initiative, where, and we sell this to the European mm. public, that if a million people sign a petition that the, that the European Commission will, will consider bringing a law in and having a big debate about it, unless, of course, that the initiative proposes reductions of the powers of the EU, and if that happens, it's put in the bin. It's not worth the paper it's written on. It's absolute nonsense. Surprisingly but the thing no. is, Glenn, is that from, from uh, outside this place, mm. people look at the MEPs mm. calling for more power, I want to be at the table, and it looks <coughs> a bit pathetic, really, doesn't it? It doesn't look like MEPs are actually dealing with the stuff that people care about. I, I don't think that's true. Fiona mentioned SWIFT, and that's a good example of where we have used our extra powers to make sure that we protected the citizen, the information of citizens. You know, the US wanted all the information on financial transactions of every citizen in the EU, mm -hmm. and we wanted to make sure that that wasn't just given away without any protections. So that was where we used our powers. However, what it hasn't been as some would have you believe, a move to a European super state. That has not happened under Lisbon. That was yeah, the sort of thing that was said, yeah. a load of nonsense, a load of I, rhetoric, I, and it has not happened. I, I agree with Dennis actually about Swift. What, what Lisbon has resulted, of course, is a huge amount of confusion. It was certainly sold as a way to streamline power, but we have now more presidents than you can shake yes. a sticker. Well, We've uh, created a president of the council, but we still have the rotating presidency of yes. member states. Really nobody's, come to nobody's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me, let me ask you now. Nobody, let's nobody start is sure who's in charge. Start Starting with you, problem. Nigel, and very briefly, <coughs> what has been the defining moment of the year for you? There was a moment at the end of September when 100,000 trade unionists were marching through Brussels and forming up in Place Luxembourg outside the Parliament, complaining at the austerity cuts that were being brought in and forced upon member states. And at that very moment, <coughs> the Budget Committee voted for an 85% increase in the MEP's entertaining allowance. I think that sums up this massive divide that's got wider in 2010 between what ordinary people want and what this political class in these institutions want. And, and as somebody that wants Britain to withdraw from the European Union, 2010 has been a good year. <laughs>
Glenys. I think probably my colleague, Ari McCarthy, brought in uh, curbs on bankers' bonuses, and I think that was a really good thing because nobody else was doing it. So we made sure that uh, bankers could not get profit from sort of short-termism, that they, they got rewarded for long-term investment. And I think that was a really, really good piece of legislation. And now they're leaving London. They're going to Zurich. Well, Wonderful. that's debatable. Well done. Terrific. Fiona. What matters to me is that we do just remember <coughs> above the politics <coughs> that we are in this together, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on the economy, um, whether it's on things like energy security. So my favourite moment was actually today um, when we voted to ask the Commission to come forward for, with binding energy efficiency targets to make sure that we don't waste energy and tackle all those things because we are in this together and if one country doesn't do something that affects all of us and that is the main problem um, with Nigel and company who seem to think that he can live in a little bubble and Nigel the world and outside doesn't get in. Nigel and your coalition partners. The main, we'll the, 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 main, not just the main political event of the year was undoubtedly the euro crisis. I mean, that's the one that we'll have. It's, it's, it, it's the euro starting to, to unravel at the edges, the great single currency project. And uh, I think the crisis in Greece brought home to people the true extent of, uh, of trying to fit together fundamentally um, irreconcilable economies. And uh, the, the, the painful austerity that's been imposed on Greece island probably now Portugal, that will have by far the biggest effect on people's living standards. Okay, well, thanks all of you. We'll have to leave it there. And that's all from me and my guests here at the European Parliament in Strasbourg.